Hello there, Phil258, Life and Death students. Um, this is going to be my second lecture on uh, Cartesian dualism. Uh, this is uh, Objections to Cartesian Dualism. And uh, I'm continuing with the same slideshow, the Cartesian Dualism slides that I'll make available to you. And if anyone wants to look, um, there is a separate uh, handout version of the highlights here. It's handout 9 for this class. If you remember, Last time I was talking about a couple of arguments for Cartesian dualism, Descartes' argument from doubt and the conceivability argument from the uh, second meditation and the sixth meditation respectively, and these were supporting this theoretical perspective that we're calling Cartesian dualism after René Descartes. Uh, in a nutshell, the idea that a person is a, a mixed substance composed of a, a physical body and a non-physical soul or mind, and that um, the mind the Cartesian mind is the fundamental source of our, our mental properties, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and so on, and that there's a two-way causal interaction between them. So I'm going to start off just with uh, a look at the theory if you want to get caught up. And we're going to start talking about some um, tough questions for this theory and a specific argument or two against it. Okay, so here's a, uh, a when question. When in the course of human development, from conception onward, do we get a soul? This is a tough question for dualists, given that there's sort of a, a gradual, continuous series of changes in the developing organism as um, we go from embryo to fetus to baby and so forth. It's, it's tough to pick a place to draw the line and say that's where one gets a soul. It's also a how question. How do we get it? Is it given to one by God? On some views, um, the mind or the soul emerges when brain functioning reaches, reaches an appropriate level of complexity. Um, I guess someone might think it's at conception. So tough questions for dualist answer. I'm not going to pursue this here. Maybe, who knows, a discussion forum might, uh, might be fun on this someday. Here's another question. What about non-humans? sort of a, a question of scope. Do non-humans have souls as well? If so, which ones? Um, some dualists say that anything conscious has to have a soul and nothing um, nothing without the capacity for consciousness has a soul. So some dualists are, are happy to attribute souls even to beings with you know, minimal consciousness. Who knows? Maybe um, insects and earthworms and things like that. Maybe. Here's a question uh, about the mind-body relation. How does an immaterial, that is, non-physical soul, interact with the physical body? And this sort of raises the problem of interaction that um, I'm going to talk most about today. Okay. Um, in order to motivate this problem, we could think of Cartesian dualism as sort of a combination of a general dualism about the human person. Okay, so human persons have both material bodies and immaterial or non-physical souls or minds. By the way, I'm using immaterial and non-physical as synonyms. The idea is that they, these things lack uh, mass and they lack uh, extension in space. They don't take up any space. Okay, and interactionism is basically this thesis that a person's body and mind, whatever exactly the mind is, they interact. They enter into a direct two-way causal interactions. Um, body to mind and mind to body. And, you know, interaction is the common sense view because what we think affects what we do, right? Um, you might open the fridge because you want to get a drink. This is your mind, your desire for a drink affecting your body, your um, opening the fridge behavior. And vice versa, the ways in which our senses are stimulated, uh, they affect our, our minds. Okay? You might have a mental image of a stop sign because your eyes are stimulated by light and your optic nerve fires, um, ultimately forming an image in your mind. This is body affecting mind. And again, Cartesian dualism is, uh, in some sense, the conjunction of this general generic dualism with this very plausible thesis of interactionism. If you did the, uh, the reading, the 258 uh, Descartes packet for this, uh, this week, um, there was one page at the end which was essentially a letter 
written by uh, Elizabeth, Princess of Bohemia, to uh, René Descartes. And there's sort of a painting of Elizabeth. In a lot of sources, her name is spelled with uh, the letter S instead of the letter Z, uh, if anyone cares. And um, let's read that letter. Let's take a look at this letter. Okay. Um, before we do that, I'm just going to uh, note for one second. Um, Elizabeth here is going to talk. She wrote this letter, I believe, from The Hague in Holland, in the Netherlands, in 16, 1643, about two years after uh, Descartes published his, uh, his meditations. Okay, She's talking here about um, animal spirits, and the best way for us to think of that is, is our nerves. By the way, um, Descartes and Elizabeth, um, Descartes in particular, he knew quite a bit about anatomy from uh, the dissection of animals and so forth. Um, he knew that the brain was um, very important when it comes to thinking and consciousness. And he knew about muscles, and he knew about, um, essentially, the brain's effect on movement, muscles. And um, the interme intermediary, uh, the, the brain ultimately moves muscles with um, nerves, nerves, um, nerves firing and causing muscles to contract, and so on. And um, at the time, they called these things animal spirits. Not much was known about how uh, they operated. But that's kind of what Elizabeth has in mind here. Okay, so here's what she's saying to Descartes. I beg of you to tell me how the human soul can determine the movement of the animal spirits in the body so as to perform voluntary acts, being as it is merely a conscious substance. So by it here, she's talking about the human soul or the Cartesian mind, and merely a conscious sub substance means yeah, its only essential characteristic is um, being a conscious substance. In other words, it has no, no physical attributes. It's, it doesn't have any, any um, surface or extension. And she continues, For the determination of movement seems always to come about from the moving bodies being propelled to depend on the kind of impulse it gets from what sets it in motion, or again, on the nature and shape of this latter thing's surface. Now, the first two conditions involve contact. I guess this is... Um, being propelled, or uh, getting an impulse. Um, and the third involves that the impelling thing has extension, a surface. But you, but you, Descartes, utterly exclude extension from your notion of soul, and contact seems to me incompatible with a thing's being immaterial. She's saying here a non-physical thing can't contact any other thing. Now, there's a number of ways in which we might uh, reconstruct or present Elizabeth's argument here. I do think that even though she's being polite here, she's asking Descartes to tell her how something happens, uh, that really, under the surface, she is arguing against his view. And by the way, if anyone's interested, you could probably find this um, correspondence. This was not the end of uh, the correspondence between Descartes and Elizabeth. Descartes replied to this letter, and uh, Elizabeth replied, and so on. But let's take a look at uh, Princess Elizabeth's argument here. Um, this, I think, is a decent way to reconstruct it. In order for a thing to cause a body to move, it must exert some kind of force on a part of the body. Seems to be what she's saying. Intuitively, if you want to make something move, you kind of got to push it or pull it, right? And by the way, here body could refer to um, a person's body, as Elizabeth is sort of intending, or any physical object whatsoever. But, Elizabeth seems to be presupposing, only a physical object could exert a force on a part of the body. Only a physical object has the kind of qualities it would take. Um, having a surface or the ability to, to uh, contact something. And if we put those lines together, we can conclude that only a physical object can cause a body to move. The argument from premises 1 and 2 to the third conclusion there seems to be valid. If we add one more premise about what Cartesian dualism says, if Cartesian dualism is true, then a non-physical object can cause a body to move, we get the conclusion that Cartesian dualism is not true from the, uh, the sub-conclusion here, the intermediate conclusion, line 3, and the fourth premise. 
this is a challenging argument for Descartes, and we might think of it as one face or one facet of the problem of interaction for Cartesian dualism. Okay, I'm going to show you the argument again, and um, yeah, we'll kind of say a little bit about uh, explaining the reasoning behind Elizabeth's premises here. So let's take a look. It's important to do this line by line, right? Each premise is an independent claim saying something different from each other premise. So let's take a look at the first one. In order for a thing to cause a body to move, it must exert some kind of force on the body, on a part of the body. Okay, This basically comes from um, our reflection on ordinary cases of cause and effect, right? If you've ever played pool, um, a cue ball might hit an eight ball and make it roll. The, uh, the cue ball hits the eight ball. Uh, transfers its momentum to the eight ball in virtue of um, contact with it. It pushes it. It exerts a force. Um, my hand might pull my dresser drawer, and the drawer opens, revealing my um, my shirts and stuff like that. Right uh, here, we have pulling. You know, pushing or pulling. Um, the hand pulls the dresser drawer. Again, the hand is exerting some sort of force on the um, on the drawer, causing it to move. Um, Elizabeth's examples here involve. Um, contact, but um, maybe it's not necessary for um, a force to be exerted that the, uh, the cause be in contact with the effect. A magnet might make an iron bar move, but a magnet is still a, a physical object. Even if a magnetic field perhaps is not a, itself a physical object, there needs to be a physical object that has that quality of the, the field around it, right? Um, okay, so um, premise one which basically says that to cause a body to move, a force needs to be exerted on it, um, seems to have some good support by our ordinary reflection or observation of, of cause and effect. Everything, every kind of cause and effect that we study um, involves a force being exerted on the, um, the effect. What about premise two? Only a physical object could exert a force on a part of the body. Well, a force intuitively is a push or a pull, and it seems to be a physical property or a physical relation uh, which can cause an object to undergo some kind of change. And if a force is sort of a physical property or a physical relationship, a physical you know, relation between um, events or objects, then you know, premise two seems right. Only a physical object could exert a force. Um, a non-physical object has no mass, you know, right? No electric charge. Doesn't weigh anything. It's not positively or negatively charged. It's, it's got no surface, no surface for uh, to, to contact something else or to reflect anything off of its surface. Um, can't exert a force since it has none of these physical properties or attributes. So this lends some support to um, premise two that only a physical object could exert a force. Um, we don't really need to explain premise three because logic does it for us. You know, explaining premises one and two uh, implies that that premise, uh, the the conclusion line three, has been explained. Um, if you need to exert a force to cause a body to move, and only a, as line one says, and only a physical object could do that, as line two says, then only a physical object can cause a body to move. Okay, what about uh, premise four then? by the way. This is something that um, some of you need help on. If you take a look at premise four, I'm going to kind of mess up premise four for a moment. You know, premise four does not say that a non-physical object can cause a body to move. It says if, if Cartesian dualism is true, then a non-physical object can cause a body to move. And that's a vastly different statement than the claim that a non-physical object can cause a body to move. Okay, So premise four is about Cartesian dualism. It's about what Cartesian dualism says. And Cartesian dualism says that there's a two-way causal interaction between mind and body. So it says that the mind affects the body. That's part C. And it also says that the mind is, is non-physical which is part, part um, A of Cartesian dualism. So if Cartesian dualism is true, a non-physical object, namely um, the Cartesian mind, can cause a body to move. 
So everyone accepts premise 4. Whether you're a dualist or not, premise 4 is true because it simply is stating something about what Cartesian dualism says. Okay, since premise 4 is true in virtue of what this theory says, there's only two ways to claim that her argument is unsound. So, um, you know, someone like Rene Descartes, and by the way, it was not quite clear how Descartes responded to an argument like this. Um, Rene Descartes would have to say that um, either premise 1 or premise 2 of, of Elizabeth's argument is false. Okay. Um, I'll remind you about what premise 1 says. It says this. In order for a thing to cause a body to move, it must exert some kind of force on the body, you know, or on a part of the body. Okay? So, a dualist might say, no, that's wrong. Okay? A thing can cause a body to move without exerting any force on it. That does seem strange, um, but I suppose a dualist might be backed into a corner and want to say something like that. Or, a dualist might reject premise 2 instead. I'll remind you, premise 2 says this, only a physical object could exert a force on a part of the body. Okay, um, So someone like Descartes might say, well, no, a non-physical object could exert a force. We're sort of mistaken in thinking that um, a force is necessarily a physical um, quality or relationship between things. Maybe a non-physical object could exert some sort of non-physical force uh, on a physical body, causing a change in that physical body, some movement or something like that. I'm going to leave it to you to um, sort of digest this a little bit and uh, see, think about whether you think Princess Elizabeth's argument is um, sound or if a dualist has some sort of a good objection. Um, you know, even if there are some issues with what uh, Elizabeth is sort of assuming or presupposing here, that causation always involves um, exerting some sort of force and only physical objects could do this. Uh, some people go further. They, they claim that um, there's sort of a, a more fundamental incoherence in the idea of a non-physical entity like a Cartesian mind interacting with a physical entity like a human body or even a single neuron, right? Even a single cell, brain cell. Okay, They claim something like this. They claim that causal interaction between a non-physical mind and a physical body is inconceivable. This means, according to this premise, it, it literally cannot be imagined or comprehended how there could be a cause and effect relationship between a, a non-physical thing and a physical thing. Right? That there's, it's just literally inconceivable, uncomprehensible, unimaginable. Um, how? a non-physical thing could affect a change in a physical thing, or vice versa. And people who uh, pursue this line of thinking say that if that's true, so if premise 1 is true, uh, this causal interaction is just plain impossible. That is to say, it cannot take place. I'm sort of explaining the premises a little bit here just by presenting the argument. Um, you might remember Descartes' argument, uh, the conceivability argument that Descartes gave um, there was a premise, it was, it was premise two, it, it basically said, uh, if I can conceive of existing without a body, then this is possible. So Descartes had this sort of underlying principle that if something is conceivable, then it's possible. The critics of Descartes in this argument have um, a different principle. They, they claim that if something is inconceivable, then it's impossible. And those are different claims, actually. Um, the idea here is, if something is inconceivable, it must be impossible, and this explains premise two. Okay. Um, well, you might think, well, plenty of inconceivable things became possible. You know, maybe, maybe back in the 1930s, we couldn't send a rocket to the moon, right? It was, it was inconceivable, but it, it certainly was possible. Um, people who are giving this argument are going to say, no, even, even before people actually conceived of sending a rocket to the moon, it was still conceivable. We just kind of lacked the resources at the time to conceive of it. Um, so, so people who are giving this argument are saying it's not only it, it's not only that it hasn't been conceived how this could happen. It's it's literally inconceivable. There's no way to understand or imagine or conceive of how this could happen. Interaction between non-physical and physical things. Okay. Um, again, here's an if-then premise. If 
this kind of causal interaction is impossible, then Cartesian dualism is false. That premise is clearly true because Cartesian dualism says that this kind of interaction, not only is it, um, is it possible, it is uh, actual. It actually happens. So if, it, if it's impossible, this theory must be false. And then by sort of modus ponens, uh, Cartesian dualism is false. This is a valid argument. Um, you know, a, a dualist might try to poke a hole in either premise one or premise two. Um, maybe, maybe it's conceivable by a greater mind than a human being's mind or something like that. Or a dualist might just say, hey, maybe, um, maybe Descartes really shouldn't have assumed that if something is, is conceivable, maybe, um, existing without a body, then, then that makes it possible. Um, likewise, a, a dualist might say, well, we, we shouldn't accept premise two either. We shouldn't accept the idea that just because something is inconceivable, it therefore um, cannot take place, cannot ta possibly take place. I'm not going to go into this um, much at all here, but um, even during Descartes' time, uh, a lot of dualists were worried about um, this interaction problem, okay? And um, they became what... hope I'm spelling that right. Parallelism. They became parallelists about mind-body relationships. So, a lot of people, um, last time I was talking about Leibniz's law, Gottfried Leibniz was a dualist, but he wasn't a Cartesian dualist because he didn't agree with claim C, that there was a causal interaction between mind and body. According to someone like um, Leibniz, um, the mind and body didn't interact. They seemed to interact, but they didn't. Um, because there was sort of a pre-established harmony that God set up at the beginning, at the beginning of time, to make the physical realm and the non-physical realm sort of unfold in parallel. It's sort of like a um, a clock shop owner winding all the clocks at the beginning of the day, and uh, they all show the same time throughout the day, not because they're communicating with each other, but because there was this pre-established harmony. Um, there's another kind of parallelism called occasionalism, where, um, oh, I don't know, when someone slaps you in the face, that doesn't cause you, your pain. Um, kind of God steps in and God, God makes your mind feel pain um, at, at the occurrence of the slap. Um, these might seem very outlandish, but um, people took this problem seriously, but at, they weren't really willing to give up mind-body dualism. They, they gave up one crucial element of Cartesian dualism, this what, what I had as claim C, that there's a two-way causal interaction between mind and body, where the mind is a non-physical entity. Okay, I don't have much more for you today. This is going to be a little bit of a shorter show than, um, than the first uh, video lecture on, uh, on um, Cartesian dualism. But sometimes it's good to revisit something for a second or third time. And um, here is a... Uh, Descartes' argument from doubt as we presented it. Um, premise one says that Descartes can doubt his body, but he can't doubt himself. And premise two says, well, if that's the case, Descartes' not identical with his body. Remember Leibniz's law? Descartes' body has the property of being doubtable by him, but Descartes himself does not. And if he's not identical with his body, then dualism is true, um, because um, dualism would be... Uh, supported by the claim that a person is not merely the same as their body. Okay? And this would support uh, dualism in general, and then at least maybe give us some reason to, to think that the Cartesian brand of dualism is the one that's right. Um, Princess Elizabeth, whose letter we read, um, I, I suspect she was a materialist, someone who thought that each of us is just a very complex um, collection of cells, the human body. If she's right, if dualism's false, as her argument concludes, something's got to be wrong with Descartes' positive argument from doubt for dualism. And, um, by the way, even if you are a dualist, you might not agree with every single argument for 
the view, right? You might think, oh, there's a better argument out there than Descartes' argument from doubt. So I urge you that uh, to, to, to think that there's something fishy going on with Descartes' argument from doubt, even if you are inclined to accept the conclusion, you would just need some other reason, a better reason perhaps, for, for accepting that conclusion that a person is not just her body, right? So. Here's, a little, here's another little example. And by the way, we cast doubt on this argument with, um, remember my Marilyn Monroe parody and the, uh, the masked man example and the masked man fallacy. Imagine we have a little girl named Anna, and she's heard stories about and seen pictures of Queen Elizabeth II of um, England, Great Britain, United Kingdom. Um, but she thinks that these stories are fairy tales. She, she kind of puts uh, Queen Elizabeth in the same boat as Santa Claus, right? Or we might imagine that little Anna is old enough to uh, have, have learned that, um, you know, there's really no such thing as Santa Claus. I'm sorry if I'm breaking it to you for the first time now. Um, so she thinks, you know, Queen Elizabeth II is sort of a, a, an imaginary fairy tale queen, right? So she doubts that Queen Elizabeth II exists, but maybe she happens to be in London, and she happens to see this woman in a car, and it actually is the Queen of England. Okay? Of course, she doesn't know that. She doesn't think of this woman who she sees in the car. She doesn't think of this woman as Queen Elizabeth II, right? We could run a little argument. Anna doubts that Queen Elizabeth II exists. Well, that seems quite true, right? But she doesn't doubt that um, the woman in the car exists. She obviously sees the woman in the car right there. So we might conclude that uh, Queen Elizabeth can't be the woman in the car, but that's not right. Queen Elizabeth is simply the woman riding in the car. Okay. So the fact that these premises seem true, and we could we could call that premise one A and premise one B. You know, Anna doubts, Anna does not doubt, and then and then it seems like oh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, has this property of being doubted, and the woman in the car does not, so they can't be the same, right? Um, there's something fishy going on there. And there is something fishy going on there, I think. But um, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to sort of look at Descartes', Descartes argument from doubt, which is a valid argument, a formally valid argument, and so if it doesn't work, if it's not sound, one of those premises has to be false. Maybe more than one, but one of those premises have to be false. Um, just think about this. Maybe premise 1B is the one that's literally false. Premise 1B, part of premise 1, says Descartes cannot doubt his own existence. And that came from, remember, I think, therefore I am. Right? Cannot doubt the fact that he's thinking, so he must, be, he must exist to be the thinker of these thoughts. Um, whenever we doubt something, we sort of comprehend that we think of it in a given way, right? Anna doubted the queen when she thought of her as Queen Elizabeth II of England, right? But not when she thought of her as the woman in the car. So maybe Descartes can doubt his own existence when he thinks of himself as his body. In other words, when he's doubting his body, he might just be doubting uh, his own existence. At least this is a, what a materialist would say in response. Um, and likewise, maybe maybe Norma Jean Baker is famous, right? Maybe she's not famous under the name Norma Jean Baker, but maybe when people think of her as Marilyn Monroe, she's famous. So Norma Jean Baker is a famous person. It's just that um, not when she, not when she's thought of under that name. So there is a little bit of a, a repeat, uh, something to think about regarding the argument from doubt. Um, next time on this, there is Madonna. Um, you ever heard of Madonna? Pop star? She had a, a big hit, Material Girl. You could um, watch the video on YouTube. It's kind of fun. She claims that we're all material girls and boys, living in a material world, right? Next time, we're going to take a look at um, another view about the nature of the human person, materialism, according to which... Um, a person is simply uh, his or her body with all the incredible and complex parts of that body. We're going to talk about this perspective. Um, you have a reading to do, the, uh, the mind-body problem, little essay that I wrote for you, and um, see you next time.